is NC Spin, an unrehearsed discussion on issues of interest to North Carolinians. Now, here is your moderator, Tom Campbell. COVID-19 is the topic. We've got some interesting information for you on this week's NC Spin. Today's tools make you a real DIYer, and as a member of an electric cooperative, you have lots of valuable tools to help you do it yourself in controlling your home energy use and budget, leaving you free to be dad. The big issue in 2020 is health care. Let's talk basics. You are the key to your own personal health, but there is strong evidence that if you have a relationship with a family physician, your quality of life will be better. You'll likely live longer and you'll have 33% lower health care costs. Your family doctor knows you, has your medical history, and can quickly diagnose health problems. Family Physicians, your trusted health care advisor for life. Most of us have been focused on the health-related issues and the economy so far as COVID-19 is concerned, but perhaps the single most important function of state government is education, where we spend 57 cents of every tax dollar received. We want to talk about how education is being impacted during this coronavirus uh, pandemic, and we've turned to the person known as the education legislator. Representative Craig Horn from Union County. By way of introduction, Craig is a retired food broker from Union County. He's been a legislator since 2010. He chairs both the appropriations and policy committees in the North Carolina House, and frankly, is a person that, that we have turned to on many occasions uh, for information. Uh, Craig, welcome to the show. And I notice that you're wearing your uh, coronavirus uh, beard. <laughs> The, the corona beard, that's exactly right. That's first time in my life I've ever had facial hair. Is this, is this like baseball players in, uh, going up to the, leading up to the World Series where you don't shave it until it's over? That's exactly it. Or, or hockey, it's our, it's our Stanley Cup beard. We don't shave until we win the cup. There you go. North Carolina schools years uh, was disrupted on March 13th when school was suspended, supposedly, to May 15th. Uh, will students return to school at all this year? Is the school year over, essentially? That's a hard question to answer. And, of course, it's not within the legislature's power to make that determination. That determination will be made by the governor. But undoubtedly, the impact of that decision is huge. It's already huge. Kids have not been in school since, I think, March, March 13th. 12th, March yeah. 13th. That's a lot of instructional time that's been taken away from them, and it's devastating to education. How could you possibly catch up? I mean, the school year has to end sometime in June, we would assume, normally. So logic would tell you they can't catch up. Even if they go back in May 15th, they won't be able to catch up on much of what they've missed. So essentially, I sus suspect it's probably over. Yeah, even if they do go back on the 15th or 16th of May, the first week or 10 days is going to be in readjusting to the school of environment, course. to each yeah. other. Everybody's got a story, the excitement, the, just the <sighs> we're back to some almost some kind of normal. Yeah. Yeah. Education, the delivery of education is has for mo the most part ended as we have come to know it. I think that's exactly correct. Now. Uh, state law says that schools cannot open any earlier than the Monday closest, closest to August 26th, and yeah. the session has to end on the Friday closest to June 11th. Obviously, the calendar is all askew right now. Is the legislature going to have to come in and do something about uh, some calendar flexibility? Well, you know, this is a challenge that we've faced for years. It's not just unique to the COVID pandemic that we're uh, enduring at the moment. But there's no question in my mind that we've got to do something about instructional time. And kids have been out too long. I, we're hopeful that the legislature will move diligently to, uh, to, to change the calendar, allow instruction to begin sooner, especially for uh, the kids that are suffering the most, uh, that are the most academically at risk. Yes. So that's going to be a proposal, no question. Uh, and, and so trying to maintain that 180 days, uh, is that going to be kept sacrosanct? Well, that's, that's, that's another piece of the puzzle. 180 days, what's the magic of 180 days? Uh, my, my concern is 
getting kids ready for the next step, whatever the next step might be, whether it's a fourth grader going to fifth grade or a high school senior going into college or into the workforce. We've got our obligation is to prepare kids. Can that be done in 180 days when you've already lost three months? Uh, I doubt it. I don't think so either. Uh, it was hoped that schools could transition to online learning kind of experience right. during this. How well, from your standpoint, how well has that worked? I'd give us a C minus. Which in some areas, actually, and I'll use Onslow County as an example, they, they have hardly missed a beat. They are doing really, really well with online learning. But in other areas, it's, it's spotty at best. We know we've got connectivity issues. We've got device issues. And, and I'll say this as well, Tom. Learning online is different than learning in the classroom setting. No question. Setting. No question. And it's, and it's the same way with teaching. Teaching online is different than teaching in a classroom setting. These are skill sets that we haven't fully developed across North Carolina or across this nation. Uh, you know, you and I have talked before about reforming public education. Uh, this, yes, is, sir. this is forcing reforms. Do you think they That's will be reform lasting reforms? You think they'll be lasting reforms? Yes, I actually do. I think we've come to the realization that that the internet is here to stay. It's not just a game or a toy. <laughs> it, it is, and frankly, I'm going to coin a phrase from, from Dr. Jackson, uh, Tony Jackson in Vance County. This is a COVID opportunity, an opportunity to truly reform how we deliver education. I've long talked about taking education to the kids, not the kids to education. I spent 40 years in the food business. I talked then about taking food to the people, not people to the food. Now is that opportunity to truly take advantage of the digital environment, of technology, to deliver a high-quality education to every student. The challengers are manifest. Connectivity and devices are just the first two pieces of that challenge. It's the skill sets that we have to develop. Where do we learn that? And, we, and one thing we know for sure, we don't learn it overnight. No, I was getting ready to say, part of this is the teachers going back to school to learn how to That's deliver right. this kind of instruction yeah. and also changing to some extent the roles that they play. Uh, because yeah. if you've got good digital online learning, the teacher can transition into becoming more of a coach and a mentor uh, and helping guide students who need help, right? That's right. That's right. And, and that's been happening in some classrooms. The classroom today by and large, doesn't look like much like the classroom that you and I uh, into, endured in, to a great extent when we were kids. The classroom today is a different setting. Kids today are different. They learn differently than we learned. They're, because the everything's changed. The, the tsunami of information, how do you critically determine right. what's real and what's not real? Uh, the social environment is different. So this and is they know a how to make these time. devices work better than than we do. I mean, uh, they're used to uh, from yeah. the earliest age on. They've been using these handheld devices and tablets and so forth. Uh, but okay, let's talk a little bit about problems with this. In addition to yeah. having curriculum, in addition to having teachers who are uh, prepped and taught how to do this, we've also got supply issues here. We've got issues with the fact that many schools uh, in many districts. The kids don't have laptops or, or, or uh, devices, uh, and, and this is a need. And then you couple that with the fact that in many rural counties, uh, they don't have access to broadband Internet. Right. Well, and, and those are the two key issues that have to be addressed right now. First, let's talk about connectivity. My own personal opinion is we may need to move to a, to a status in, a, in, a, in, our, in our state, in our nation, where connectivity to the Internet is uh, equitable with access to television, telephones, electricity. Every house in North Carolina has access to those things. They need to have access to connectivity. And that's not just an education issue, Tom. That's a commerce and job development issue. It is. Then the, the second part is or the devices. And you know, devices are expensive. Well, so are textbooks. But textbooks go out of date. Well, I guess devices do too, but not quite it. Textbooks quite are out of date when they're man. printed. Well, that's exactly right. Because of, so, 
the, the moving to online education or the or using online as a supplement or as a another tool in our education tool bag has to be done. Now, we've got surplus computers from the state that need to get into the hands of needy kids. We've got a number of, of our private enterprises stepping up to provide devices. So this is an opportunity for all of us to come together, the utilities, the, the device manufacturers, the distributors, and the teachers to meet the needs of kids in the 21st century. Craig, you are a person who is known as a uniter. Uh, well, let us hope you can unite uh, all the different factions around this. There are a lot of kids typically during normal times uh, who are online, but they are having yeah. to go to the McDonald's or to the Starbucks or to their public library to be able to get high-speed broadband Internet access. Uh, now, during this pandemic, those things are closed, so they have no access. Well, that's true. However, I'm happy to tell you that many of these facilities, the library, the, the McDonald's, the fire stations, they have continued to keep their hot spots open. And, and that's been a, a godsend for many kids. But it, it's got to go beyond that. That Getting in the car, driving to this place or that place is not a long-term solution. We've yeah. got to be able to bring connectivity right to the home. There's some safety issues involved with that, and I'm sure you uh, That's would say that. That's exactly right. Uh, let me switch gears for just a second. Um, sure. One thing that's been interrupted on this is end-of-year testing, uh, in which we are able to tell how well the kids have, have learned this year. Um, the legislature is going to be asked to suspend testing requirements. We know that. Right. Uh, what's being considered uh, when y'all come back to Raleigh next week? What what impact uh, will this suspension on testing have? Because it has a lot to play with uh, teacher bonuses, principal bonuses, right. uh, school ratings, uh, any number of issues. And, and exactly right. It's all intertwined. It's not just simply did the kid pass or fail a course. As you said, it, it impacts the letter grade on the outside of school, what we call school performance grades. It impacts teacher pay, if teacher raises, uh, tenure, uh, everything. But we've lost that portion of the year where testing comes to play. So we, it would not be fair to the teachers or the kids to rely on testing from this year that's not going to exist what are we going to do about that? So we're waiving most of those testing requirements. The, the, the pressure then is on us that when we can get back underway to ascertain, okay, where are the kids? We need to, have, to be able to determine where the kids are uh, at that point and then adjust the curriculum to meet their needs. The, if we're going to expect the kids to have achieved a certain level, we need to know Re the reality is what we it need is. to know what level have they achieved <laughs> yeah. and go from there. Meet the kids where they are. How, how, are, how are you going to handle teacher and principal bonuses, uh, school grades, and so forth like that uh, when you, you don't well, have this uh, test? The, we don't have them, and so the consequence is we're not going to handle them. We're, we're going to have to kind of just hold those in abeyance. The, what, the teach, what the school grade is 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 what it's going to be. Uh, we're so not in other words, going to last year's grade, that. last year's grade right. will, will carry over to this year. Right. Yeah. We're not going to penalize people. If we tested now after this, uh, in, uh, this, uh, this stop area, this time when we've stopped education, that would not be fair, nor would it be reflective of what's actually been accomplished. You've been a key member of this, uh, it's called an education working group. Uh, yes. and, and I know from having talked with you that you've been on almost constant telephone conversations with people. You're coming back to Raleigh next week. By the way, are you going to shave that beard when you come back? You know, that's, some people say it makes me look younger. I kind of like that idea of making me look younger. All right. Uh, uh, one of the things that is going to be considered is uh, we had passed a law saying that in grades K through 12, uh, K through 3, we were going to have a, progr a program of reducing classroom size. Uh, right. How's that going to be affected by what's going on right now? Uh, my opinion, we're going to have to delay that uh, that year that we've had of another step that's supposed to go into into effect this coming year. We we're playing with un we're playing with cards face down. 
Yes. So we're, we're going to request suggest uh, uh, put in front of the legislature uh, a bill to delay that classroom size reduction for another year. How about uh, fund, funding flexibility? A lot of schools are, are, are making requests saying, hey, uh, with all that's going on here, we need a little bit more flexibility. How much is too much? Well, that's the question that's been asked for, for decades. How much is too much? We, we legislators, we love to talk about local flexibility and local control, but then we turn around and take it away from you and tell you, yeah, well, you can go ahead and do that, but we're not paying for it. Uh, no, no, we're going to have to sit down and work these things out and recognize that a lot of decisions really need to be made at the level closest to the student. That's going to be key because students are in different places all over this state. Tell us some of the other items that this education, if you don't, I, I'm not asking you to reveal what the legislature is going to do in the short session next week, but some of the other things that you, your working group is considering. Well, we're, we're, the biggest piece of the puzzle right now, the un, big unknown is school calendar. When will we start? How soon? How late? Who's going to have a job and who isn't? We've, we've talked about testing and licensure. We've, we've bumped up against licensure. We're going to have teachers coming out of teacher prep programs that have not completed all of their in-service hours. Well, we're recommending that those be waived and we give them some additional help. We're going to need a lot of new teachers next year. We need a lot of new teachers every year. There is the turnover that is inherent in the teaching profession. Just normal. There's the growth of the student count growth. So we need to get these new teachers into the classroom. And quite frankly, they come armed with, with new enthusiasm and some new ideas that are also very helpful to, you, to us. So we're, we're going to have do, to do that part in preparing our kids and, next, and allow that flexibility to happen. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, we, we talked about end of the year and how we go about figuring out end of the year test grades and so forth like that. But let's talk a little bit about normal grading. Uh, here we are at the end of the year, and uh, particularly I'm, I'm thinking about co uh, high school seniors uh, who, who are getting ready to graduate, many of whom want to go on to higher education. Um, right. uh, DPI has, has said that the students uh, will not be given grades for this spring semester unless the right. district can demonstrate that they've had an opportunity to learn. Well, how's that impacting these kids? Well, we've done a lot of homework on that, talking to our colleges and universities, both independent and UNC system, uh, about their uh, admission policies to make sure that we're not going to harm these kids. We have still a few challenges to overcome, particularly for kids moving to perhaps to another state where the, the laws are different and what the requirements are. But here in North Carolina, the, the high school seniors pretty much knew who was going to graduate and who was in danger of not graduating before March, the, the March suspension came to be. So we're, we passed or allow the pass-fail uh, grading system rather than penalize kids that often, hey, when you and I were kids, did we go get, start off the year really bearing down? No, nah, we normally... Toward the end of the year is when we got serious end of the about year, it. Yeah, yeah, push. That's right. The cram, man. Yeah. We got to cram. Yeah, yeah. But there, so I don't want to penalize kids that uh, that are being kids. That's come on. That's not fair. So so when when a third of their school year has been taken away from them by and large to penalize them and stick them with the grade they had at that point. That's not fair, nor does it reflect the learning process. Well, and you talked about college admissions. There's some real issues so far as uh, if I'm in the admissions department of a particular college or university because I'm looking at some of these applications. And by the way, th this is really a, an interesting time period when this was done because <laughs> many of these kids don't, unless they applied to early admission, many of these kids don't know until mid-March, right. whether they got accepted or not. And in many instances, it is subject to your final grades for the year. Yeah. Uh, you just keep piling on all the challenges that we're trying to deal with. I ain't making it and easy we, for you, am I? Yeah, and, yeah, that's exactly right. There are a lot more unknowns than there are knowns. But by and large, we've been able to meet each of these challenges for every kid to ensure that they're going to be eligible for admission to a college or university of their choice. 
We're working with those college universities. We're all in this boat together. It's not just North Carolina kids. It's kids from all over the country that are facing right. these same challenges. And it's not just North Carolina colleges and universities. We're all facing the same thing. We're figuring it out. As they say, we're building the airplane while we fly it, <laughs> which is a, a scary thought. It's but very, very we're, interesting. we're working out most of those problems. Uh, Craig, I can't, I can't let this interview end without talking about uh, the great controversies that are going on between DPI and our State Board of Education. And you, you made a statement that has just really stuck with me that it's time to quit throwing each other under the bus. Yeah. You, are, you are a person known to bring folks together. What's it going to take to get on the same page between DPI and the State Board? Perhaps this type of a crisis is what it's going to take. We need to focus on the kids and not on our individual political or other agendas. Let's focus on what produces an outcome for the kids. And we focus there. There are so many more things on which we agree than what those things on which we don't agree. So let's work on that. We're making some progress. I can't say that we've solved the problem or what it, even to a certain extent, what is the problem? Uh, it's a challenge, Tom. It's been a challenge. It's not going to go away overnight. But we are finding a lot more common ground as we proceed to deal with a crisis in front of all of us. It's the kids that are important. This that's is, where we need to focus. This has been a controversy, uh, Craig, that's been going on since Fido was a pup. Um, that's exactly right. The question is, uh, in public school governance, do we need to change the Constitution here? I mean, we've had lawsuit after lawsuit. We've had uh, the personalities of the individuals uh, don't really matter. It's been a case where right. nobody really knows who's in charge of public education. And the Constitution is confusing, quite frankly, insofar as we appoint a state board of education and require and, and give them the power over policy. And then we elect a superintendent of public education and give him what? What power do we give him? Now, the legislature has moved to some extent on that. But the, the Constitution is clear that the, that the superintendent is a member of the state board. He's the ad chief administrative officer. And, and one could easily make the argument that this is a guy that runs DPI. But then you look at practice over the years, and it's become very muddled. And the challenges go back long before this Republican majority, well, as you said, oh, no, since Fido was a forever. Pro. Yeah, forever. We are, as some people may not realize, we're one of the few states that actually elect a superintendent of public instruction. Right. Most states have the board, the state board of education, hire the best possible person. And I'm not suggesting that we don't have the best possible person. I'm just saying that right. the system is a little goofy. And that person serves at the pleasure. That's exactly right. Whereas here, the, the, the superintendent is elected by the majority of the, pe of the people that turn out on, on election day. Yeah. Now, so what is his reporting requirement? He doesn't really report to the governor, and he doesn't really report to the State Board of Education. He reports to the people of, of North Carolina. And that sounds like a good thing on its surface. And it, it's going to be really hard to take that authority away from the people. But by the same token, we've got a State Board of Education who is, who is by Constitution, obligated to set policy in North Carolina. So that causes the heartburn that we've been seeing for decades. Craig, yeah, I think I wanna, we need to reform the Constitution on this issue. Craig, I, I, I got a couple of minutes left. I want to make sure okay. we talk a little bit about the university. The university system obviously has been impacted with this. They've come to y'all and said uh, they're going to have to cut their budgets, but they're asking you for $45 million to help them get through this period. What's your reaction to all of that? Well, I think we do need to help them get through this period. And that's not just the university system of UNC. I think we need to help our independent college and universities get through this period as well. This is a tough time, a very tough time for, for these folks. Uh, it's a, again, let's focus on what meets the needs of our students across North Carolina and help our universities, being UNC system or independent college universities and community colleges, let's help them help our students. What's in their best interest? That's what we need to be looking at.
Craig Horn, uh, I have good feelings uh, with, with you uh, dealing with these issues, and I thank you for that. Uh, as usual, you are candid, uh, and you tell it like it is, and I appreciate that so very much. Thank you for well, being with us. I appreciate what you're doing, Tom. All right. Thanks very much for this opportunity. Well, you've heard our spin on the issues of the day to stay informed all during the week. Give your feedback, read my weekly column, visit our website, ncspin.com, or catch NC Spin on Facebook. And join us next week. We've got more balanced debate for the Old North State. Until then, stay informed and watch out for the spin. Today's tools make you a real DIYer, and as a member of an electric cooperative, you have lots of valuable tools to help you do it yourself in controlling your home energy use and budget, leaving you free to be dad. The big issue in 2020 is healthcare. Let's talk basics. You are the key to your own personal health, but there is strong evidence that if you have a relationship with a family physician, your quality of life will be better you'll likely live longer, and you'll have 33% lower health care costs. Your family doctor knows you, has your medical history, and can quickly diagnose health problems. Family Physicians, your trusted health care advisor for life. North Carolina Channel is made possible by the financial contributions of viewers like you who support the UNC-TV network. Quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV.